The book of Revelation, as most people here will know, tells of four horsemen of the apocalypse. The first rider, clothed in white, comes out to conquer. The second in red represents civil war and slaughter. The third in black is famine. And the fourth rider is on a pale green horse. I quote, its rider's name was death and Hades followed with him. They were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill uh, with sword, famine and pestilence and by the wild animals of the earth. As Christians in the 21st century, we know and understand these four terrible riders and all they symbolize. We see the war of intended conquest in Ukraine and we witness the suffering which flows from that. We see civil war in South Sudan and Yemen and the terrible toll on entire populations. We understand famine and want and the rising numbers of the world's population who live below subsistence level. And we know that death and Hades have come close to home through a global pandemic which has claimed so many lives. But in the 21st century, there are two new riders, and they are the subject of much of our meeting today. The fifth horseman is invisible. This rider represents the unseen blanket of greenhouse gas, which silently envelops the earth. Year by year, trapping more of the sun's energy inside the atmosphere and raising global temperatures to critical levels. This horseman has the power to disrupt weather, to extend deserts, to set fire to the forests, to cause floods and storms, to melt the ice caps and raise sea levels to disastrous levels. This rider can be stopped. The world has a small window in which to act, but only if every nation, every institution, every faith, every family act together to reach net zero and to do so without delay. The sixth rider is astride a grey horse made of gunmetal, a machine, not a living creature, spewing an invisible poison from its mouth. This rider is hard to see against the landscape. Its work is gradual, not sudden, a silent undermining of the vital web of life. Earth is the only planet the only corner of this vast universe where we are certain that there is abundant life. Yet the once rich tapestry of life on Earth is now being degraded year by year because of the expansion and greed of a single species, ourselves. The Sixth Rider represents a systematic destruction of nature and the natural world, the second great environmental challenge of our time. This rider works destruction by stealth and in secret. The birds fall silent. The insects disappear. The soil becomes less rich in microorganisms. The fish die in the rivers. Humanity is putting at risk the very ecosystem on which our life depends. There are signs that the world is waking up to the environmental disaster we face. Wildlife populations worldwide declined by an average of 69% between 1970 and 2018. 69%. Latin America and the Caribbean experienced a 94% drop in its wildlife population.
population. Wild animals now account for just 4% of mammal biomass globally. Humans and our livestock account for the other 96%. 60% of the UK's flying insects have vanished in the last 20 years. They're vital for pollination and the food chain. Britain, our own country, is currently one of the most nature-depleted countries in the world. Over one million species are currently threatened with extinction. <coughs> and these two new horsemen of the apocalypse work closely together in a spiral of destruction. Biodevice de loss is one of the accelerators of climate change and global heating leads to more diversity loss. Both need to be addressed together, and both need to be addressed locally as well as globally, hence are giving so much time uh, to this theme in our synod today. And this is a critical moment. In December, just a few weeks ago, the world agreed a new set of global targets for restoring nature at the COP15 conference in Montreal. The principal goal of the Kunming Montreal Agreement is to protect 30% of the Earth's land, oceans, coastal areas, and inland waters by 2030. Just six days ago, the news led with the agreement of the UN High Seas Treaty, setting 30% of the world's oceans into protected areas. Now, 30% is not a random <coughs> number chosen because of the target date of 2030. It represents the minimum, the scientific consensus, on the minimum protected area, which will allow the regeneration of the whole. Tomorrow, David Attenborough begins a major new television series, Wild Isles, focusing on the decline of biodiversity in Britain and Ireland and how that can and needs to be addressed. But why should Christians care? Why should the diocese or the local church invest resources in restoring nature alongside working towards net zero? Why do we need to work at the ecological conversion of every disciple, in the words of Pope Francis? Why should we be giving our time today to this aspect of God's mission? Well, there are a million reasons why. The most immediate is, of course, the whole future of life on earth, the love we bear our neighbours, our children, our grandchildren, and those who will come after us. Our life is inextricably linked to and dependent on the biodiversity of the earth. Yet scientists have named these decades as the age of extinction. If we sleepwalk through the next 10 years, the tragedy will be indescribable and irreversible for the future of life on earth. The Bible teaches us from Genesis to Revelation that humanity is part of God's creation with a particular relationship with the natural world. If you doubt that, you might want to explore Psalm 104 or the final chapters of Job or Proverbs 8 or the Sermon on the Mount or Colossians 1. Read each text through the lens of these two terrible riders. But for today, let me take you to a handful of verses in the book of Genesis. Genesis 1, as you will know, describes the creation of the heavens and the earth with human, humankind created on the sixth day. There God gives humanity responsibility for the earth. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Now the words fill and subdue and dominion are sometimes misunderstood willfully as giving authority to exploit creation and misuse nature. 
but properly interpreted, they give a dignity and an agency and a responsibility, a sacred trust to every human person, male and female. This is the stewardship of a good shepherd with responsibility to care for the flock, not the authority to plunder or destroy. And that responsibility is made very, very clear in the second creation story in Genesis 2. Here we read this. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the word translated till is found again in Genesis 3.23. The Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So we have this command to till both before and after the fall. So what's the core meaning of that word to till? It's interesting that the Hebrew word is not the normal word for ploughing or gardening. The Hebrew word is eved, and the root meaning of the word is to serve, to serve. Eved can also mean to worship and to work. It's the word used of the service of God and of the servant of the Lord in other Old Testament texts. It's a key word for Jesus' understanding of Christ's own ministry and our understanding of who Jesus is. The word keep, which goes with it, means to watch over and to guard. So humanity is here given a sacred responsibility to serve and steward and watch over the earth, the land, the water, and all that lives in them. Hebrew scholars note that event can also be translated as observe, <coughs> preserve, and conserve, all variations of the English word to serve. Tilling and keeping the earth are foundational to the exploration of human identity and vocation. Pope Francis's encyclical, Laudato Si, explores these texts in Genesis. They, I quote, suggest that human life is grounded in three fundamental and closely intertwined relationships with God, with our neighbour and with the whole, with the earth itself. According to the Bible, these three vital relationships have been broken, both outwardly and within us. This rupture is sin. <coughs> Restoring our relationship with the earth is therefore core to our own salvation, won by Christ on the cross. In Romans 8, Paul explores the relationship between our own salvation as women and men and the salvation and healing of the earth. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labour pains until now. So what are the ways in which we can, with others, repair and restore creation in the places where we live in our generation? Conservation is not enough. We have a tremendous opportunity as a diocese to shape and influence the ecology of the Thames Valley in the coming years. We're able, as we know, to help and support the pathway to net zero through the actions we take in schools and churches and vicarages across three counties. Every single place in our diocese has a church and congregation who are able to work together with their community to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to work to restore and rebuild the natural world. We have green spaces and churchyards. Individually, we have farms and gardens. Churches across the diocese are rewilding their churchyards to encourage biodiversity 
and provide a richer habitat for flora and fauna to flourish, often normally within the framework of eco-church. St Mary's Church in Wargrave introduced a let it grow zone in part of their churchyard by halting regular mowing and strimming of the grass. This has promoted wildflower growth and provides a habitat for animals and invertebrate species, helping to increase the biodiversity of the churchyard. The church has also installed bat boxes and bird boxes and created a large compost area that provides a shelter for hedgehogs. Imagine if Wargrave's story was repeated 800 plus times in every churchyard in the diocese. As Christians, we can work in partnership with others. I'm delighted that our diocese has an active partnership with the Berks, Bucks and Oxfordshire Wildlife Trust. The Trust will be running two training courses in our churchyards in April and May, one about managing green spaces and the other on doing basic site surveys, uh, covering species identification and vegetation, etc. There's an inspiring web page which we launched today called Wilder Churches, which features examples of churches in Oxford Diocese taking steps and action uh, that others can follow. Local Christians and churches can stimulate wider initiatives for nature. Hungerford has a great story about tree planting. You're not going to believe this. Hungerford has stimulated the planting of 6,440 trees to date. I think that's amazing. Churches in Greenham and Wendover and elsewhere are also planting trees. They're not at such an incredible scale. Engaging with gardening and green issues and biodiversity is becoming and needs to become a normal part of church life across the diocese. This is a really key point and a key moment. There will be a particular opportunity over the next few years for local government to play a key role in the recovery of nature and therefore for Christians to be involved at local level in shaping this nature recovery. Last year, the UK government launched the Nature Recovery Network through Natural England, which draws together a range of partners across every community. A key part of the Nature Recovery Network will be for every county and every local authority to draw up its own local nature recovery strategy, LRNS. And these strategies will be key building blocks for the recovery of nature nationally. They're a key outworking of the Environment Act 2021 and a very powerful piece of legislation for local action. The government is currently taking uh, further initiatives on local planning, on land use, sustainable farming, care of the soil and rivers, which all offer opportunities for partnership and for the voices of local people to be heard locally. We must not be silent for the sake of the earth. As many will know, I'm part of the House of Lords Environment and Climate Change Select Committee. We've just begun our third major inquiry, and it's on protected areas and to scrutinise the government's plans to protect 30% of our land and coastal areas by 2030. At present, it's estimated that less than 5% is well protected. Much greater areas are designated, but not yet well protected. The earth needs humankind to till it and keep it. Humanity needs the earth for our survival, for our health, for human flourishing. We need clean air, clean water, abundant biodiversity, and we need not just to conserve, but to restore the natural world carefully and intentionally in the coming decades. The Church of England is not able to do this by ourselves, but we can and should offer leadership wherever we can for the sake of the earth. These two new horsemen of the apocalypse are truly terrifying the more you look at them. We have time just to respond to the challenges they bring. So may God give us grace and strength to work together in this generation for the renewal of the earth. 